You are listening to the War on the Rocks podcast on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. My name's Ryan Evans. I'm the founder of War on the Rocks. And in this episode, I spoke with Ambassador Marek Magyarowski, the Polish ambassador to the United States, who was kind enough to host me at the embassy for an extended conversation on the Polish defense buildup and European security affairs. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, you've sort of had a circuitous route to becoming a diplomat. So I've been here in Washington, D.C. for roughly a year and a half. Uh, my mission began in uh, November 2021, uh, just after the pandemic, which is an important element of this story. Uh, previously, I was the Polish ambassador to Israel for three years between 18 and 21. And in my previous incarnation, I was also deputy foreign minister and a spokesperson of uh, the Polish president, the toughest job in my life, in particular because I had been a journalist for 20 years. And why did you decide to leave journalism? Well, actually, it, it, this is the saddest part of this uh, introduction. It was in 2015 when I uh, got a very lucrative and a very attractive offer from uh, the presidential chancery to become the media advisor of President Duda, who is going to visit uh, Washington, D.C. shortly, by the way. And my impression was... and. Uh, it was a period in which I already knew what direction journalism was heading. In Poland, also in America, in Europe, I think it's an irreversible phenomenon. Journalism becoming increasingly tribal, politically affiliated. So I, I preferred to become a politician, to speak more openly, paradoxically, to speak more openly about issues which were in my area of interest at the end, uh, to be a politician in disguise of a journalist. I'd, I'd like to focus most of our conversation on Poland's defense buildup, which I think it's fair to say is unprecedented, but it's in response to perhaps unprecedented times. Poland has gone well beyond the NATO minimum of 2% of GDP. Double. Double, yeah. Double as of this year, I believe, or yes. last year. Could you talk more about that buildup, where it's heading, and obviously animated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and some other factors? Uh, recalling the, the early stages of the war in Ukraine, which began in February 2022, I remember that outburst of solidarity and sympathy towards our Ukrainian brethren, if you will. So many Ukrainian families hosted by Polish families in their private homes. That was unprecedented. I think that there were two reasons. Firstly, we share the same enemy. We have for centuries. Secondly, Poland and Poles know very well what Russian occupation means. So it was our obligation, it was our duty to help the Ukrainians escape the ravages of war. And that's why now we have about 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees who chose to stay in Poland and they integrate into the Polish society smoothly. We do share so many similarities with our Ukrainian neighbors. On the other hand, you know, throughout our history, we've always been geographically squeezed between countries which, to put it mildly, have uh, never been very friendly to us. And most of them were rather hostile. Today, we share a very long border with Belarus, with uh, the Kaliningrad exclave, which is Russia, and also with unstable Ukraine. That's why we have decided to brace ourselves, actually, for a potential hypothetical, another aggression on the part of the Russian Federation in this part of the world, it's very hard to predict, of course, but I don't think that Putin will decide to attack a NATO country like Poland or Lithuania or Latvia, for that matter. Still, we are conscious and we are acutely aware of Mr. Putin's malign intentions in the longer term and his neo-imperial ambitions. That's why we are arming ourselves, not because we don't believe in the sacrosanct character of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. We do believe like uh, President Biden said a, a few months ago, that, we, that all NATO countries are ready and willing to defend every inch of NATO territory. We are ready to defend Helsinki and Stockholm and Berlin and Prague, as I believe our allies are ready and will bravely and unconditionally defend Warsaw, Prague or Vilnius. We are arming ourselves because we want to lead by example. We want to demonstrate to other countries that they also have to adhere to their commitments. They have to increase their military budgets, as we do. We have already increased our military expenditures to uh, 4% of our GDP, which is unprecedented in, in our history. 
And uh, we would like to, uh, we'd like Germany to have, to have our back. We'd like France to have our back. We would like uh, many other countries to uh, look a little bit more seriously at uh, their obligations. I read recently an expert say, I wish I could remember his name, that Poland might have the most capable land forces in uh, all of Europe in just a few years, unless, of course, Germany decides to get a little more serious. I'm not a military expert, so it's, it's hard to me, for me to, to be very specific on that particular matter. But I, I do believe that we, we, we need a stronger military, not only in terms of you know, fighter jets and helicopters and tanks and armored vehicles, also in terms of infrastructure, manufacturing facilities. I just wrote a story for National Interest about exactly those needs. I think that uh, NATO has to focus more on the industrial pillar of our cooperation, within NATO, but also within the European Union. We have been uh, you know, talking uh, for such a long time about the possibility of creating Europe's own armed forces, which is, of course, a very far, far-fetched idea. Still, I think that if we, if we somehow extrapolate this to, to the very concept of strong Europe, I think it's a, it's a very, very tempting prospect of strengthening Europe's military, also because you know we are facing so many challenges globally, not only Russia and Ukraine, also China and Taiwan, and also some you know hotspots in many other parts of the of the world. So it's it's very difficult to imagine America still being the the world policeman trying to control every aspect of you know the geopolitical configuration across the globe. So I think Europe must be stronger. Some remarks made by, by some American politicians, I think, have finally stirred up a, a, a very intense debate about Europe's uh, military capabilities, and it's good. I think that we should talk more seriously about how to boost our industrial capabilities as well in order to produce more tanks, more aircraft, more drones, and especially more ammunition. I think the industrial piece is one of the most interesting parts of this. And as it pertains to Poland specifically, Poland has, of course, become a major customer of South Korean defense firms. Could you talk more about that and why South Korea and where where is that relationship now? Firstly, I I would like to make a reference to what we did in the area of energy independence. We had to diversify our imports of raw materials. And that's why, for example, we decided deliberately to win ourselves off uh, imports of Russian gas. And that's why we, we became, roughly two years ago, we became entirely independent in, in this respect. Uh, we, are, uh, we now uh, import Norwegian gas from Norwegian deposits via Denmark to the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast. Diversification is, is the key word. Uh, and that principle applies also to our arms procurement. Of course, an overwhelming majority of uh, stuff we buy is from American defense contractors. But as I said, we, we, we try to diversify our, our imports. And of course, it, it comes with some difficulties because you, know, you, you have different platforms, uh, you have different types of weaponry, which are sometimes not compatible with each other. But on the other hand, you have to make this calculus. South Korea is a very loyal partner, not only in terms of arms procurement, but also in terms of the, of the foreign direct investment. South Korea has always been one of the most important and most generous investors in Poland, investing in various sectors of our economy. So I think that uh, deepening this cooperation, not only in terms of, of uh, military cooperation, but also industrial cooperation and economic ties is of uh, uh, paramount importance uh, uh, for Poland. There is another aspect to this, uh, namely, the South Koreans are very quick. Literally, you sign a contract and you got your, you, 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 you get your tanks and howitzers uh, and training aircraft almost immediately. We are also buying American weaponry, but the process takes much longer, is more arduous. We understand that. But in terms of our, of our needs and our preparations for a, a potential conflict, in our part, the potential conflagration in our part of the of, of Europe, time is of the essence. So, in in this is, you know, a very very superficial, but I think useful explanation of why we are strengthening now our cooperation also with South Korea. You know, you indicated it's their technology doesn't always link up as well as maybe U.S. produced stuff. How does this affect interoperability in NATO 
Well, they, uh, as you know, there are no very no, no strict rules in terms of arms procurement and what kinds uh, what what kinds of weaponry we should buy from France, from Germany, from the U.S. I mean, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, that it comes um, with challenges, yeah. of course. As I said, it's it's always a, 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 a political and economic calculus. Also political, because you know when you when you sign a contract with an American company, it's usually in, 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 when we talk about arms procurement and military equipment, it's about long term cooperation, because it's not only about buying an aircraft or buying an, uh, a battle tank. It's also about maintaining it. It's also about training the crews. It's also about uh, fuel. It's also about many other things which are somehow intrinsically connected to this one contract, to this one purchase. So I'm, uh, it's also a political decision, to put it bluntly. Uh, and that's why, for example, we, we are in a very you know awkward position because we are Poland is also a member of the European Union, and many of our European partners expect us to buy their products and their services, especially in the military domain. So on the other hand, we do consider the United States as our most steadfast and loyal and ironclad uh, ally and partner. So we we would like to to develop our cooperation mostly with American with the American government and with American defense companies. But I definitely understand why speed, and this is where South Korea has its advantages, is so important because it's really taking not just European countries but also the United States quite a lot of time to get their acts together on industrial defense industrial output. And if you can build up now. Yeah. For a threat that is right over your border, in some cases, it makes a lot of sense. NATO is, firstly, it's a nuclear superpower. Secondly, Russian conventional forces are no match for ours. That's totally clear to me and to many military experts and to many politicians in Europe. On the other hand, you know, this is a very dynamic situation. For example, since the beginning of the war, when sanctions were imposed on Russia, of both you know personal and economic nature, uh, we did expect the Russian economy to suffer much more. Conversely, they still uh, have to feel the pinch. But it's not so clear that we have crippled the Russian economy as we expected to. The, the, the Russians and the Russian society and the Russian economy are very resilient. That's why, for example, I don't believe that uh, the, the, those punitive measures that we have imposed on Russia over the last couple of months will have a, a, you know, a chilling effect on the, on the Russian economy, that they, for example, will somehow cripple the, the military production. Well, those sanctions have dented well, the, the, the shape of the, of the Russian economy. Still, I do believe that uh, what we need now is the military victory on the ground in uh, Ukraine. So it's also a very, very interesting phenomenon that we have managed to degrade the Russian army and the Russian military capabilities to such an extent, spending actually a trifling amount of money. And by the way, I would like to, to dispel all those doubts about, so to speak, the laxness of, of the European Union of, or generally of European countries spending money on the military and spending money on the military aid for Ukraine. We have uh, actually outspent the United States in uh, this respect. So uh, Europe has also contributed largely to Ukraine's war effort. We have to continue this. We have to, we have to understand that we, if we do not supply more weapons to Ukraine, if we don't provide them long-range missiles, for example, they will not be capable of winning this war. And if, we, if they don't win this war, Putin will. Well, this is what worries me is, is you're right in that we've degraded the Russian armed forces, but they have shown tremendous resilience. Uh, the, Russia has a lot of latent yeah, power. Yeah, I think it's still, you know, they have manpower. They, and all, and uh, I think that the crucial element is that uh, the, the, the difference or differences in our mentality. I'll give you one telling example. At the beginning of the war, you, you might have heard or read reports about those mobile crematoria being brought to the front lines in order to burn the bodies of the fallen Russian soldiers. Who does that in the West? I mean, I, I used to be the Polish ambassador to Israel, and I, I remember very well how they treat human life. They, are, they, no, they evacuate bodies of the fallen soldiers from behind enemy lines. They exfiltrate their troops like we do, like the Americans do, and unlike the Russians. So it's the, that blatant disregard for human life and for human dignity is, on the one hand, one of the vestiges of the Soviet mentality in contemporary Russia, but also one of the reasons 
why they get the upper hand, to put it bluntly, because they don't care, and President Putin doesn't care about human life. This puts us in a bind, actually, in this confrontation with, uh, with Russia today. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Stein, Chief Content Officer of War on the Rocks, and we're going to take a very short break to preview the latest episode of The Russia Contingency, which features a discussion between Mike Kaufman and Rob Lee, fresh back from their research trip to Ukraine. The three core issues that or challenges that Ukraine is dealing with right now remain in the following order, manpower, fortifications, and ammunition. And these challenges have only grown since we were last there in November. Uh, it's clear that Ukraine faces a rather difficult year in 2024. And in some respects, the situation has certainly grown worse. I think that Ukrainian military is actively working to stabilize the situation at the front right now. And uh, we've, particularly in this trip, uh, worked to explore aspects of the fight. For example, the growing role of drones, strike drones in particular, like FPVs, to what extent can they be used as an offset to artillery, the drone and electronic warfare contest, and, and what that fight looks like, trying to, to the extent we could lead the target in the conversation, because my experience, I'm sure Rob's experience as well has been, the technology and tactics change in this war every couple of months. That's why we try to go there every three months or so, to the extent we can, uh, to make sure we're current and we're tracking the, the, the both the situation but the evolution in what's happening this war. The Russia Contingency is available for War on the Rocks members only. If you want to become a member, head on over to waronthorocks.com slash membership and sign up today. And now back to the show. Well, this is why I agree that it's it's as much as progress as we've made with supporting Ukraine and as, as successful as they have been in, in certain aspects of this war. Uh, what does it all mean if Russia ends, w- wins at the end of the day? And that's why I think it's critical that we all find If Russia wins more. this war against Ukraine, it will be only the first step. Russia doesn't stop. I remember all those you know, lofty discussions about Russia's future. So many people in Western Europe, but also here in America, I think, some even in Poland, do uh, harbor hope that Russia will one day become more democratic, more liberal, more European, free market economy, freedom of speech, and so on and so forth. We know Russia, and we know very well that it will, it will not happen in the next two or three or five decades. It's plainly impossible. Still, there are many European politicians and economists and uh, social activists who would like Russia to join the fold, who would like to return to business as usual, who would, uh, you know, somehow reverse our decisions a couple of months ago to cut off all economic ties with Russia, to withdraw Western companies from that country, to reduce imports of Russian gas to virtually zero, and so on and so on. So we have to be very, we have to be aware that this cannot happen. What is the Polish government's position on this $300 billion in frozen Russian assets and what should be done with them? It's a a tricky legal question with many ramifications. Again, I'm not a, a legal expert, but our position is very clear. Russia must pay for the damages it has caused so far in agreement. Because my understanding is, is this question's caught up in some pretty tricky negotiations in the EU that's probably above both of our pay grades right now about whether those assets could be used to be given to Ukraine or whether the interest can be used and be given to Ukraine. There are many ways. I think that uh, those who do deal with this issue know very well that in spite of some difficult technicalities and in spite of some obstacles we would have to overcome, the, the, the general concept is for Russia to pay war reparations to Ukraine during or after the war. Uh, and also, you know, to bring uh, all those Russian leaders responsible for the atrocities committed uh, in Ukraine to justice and to hold them accountable for war crimes Russian troops have committed in, in Ukraine over the last two years. You mentioned earlier the Ar- Article 5 commitment to, for NATO countries to defend each other from attack and and that deterrent effect that that has. And 
you know, Poland has not been attacked by Russia, aside from that missile that seems to have gone off course wherever that was from. But there has been sabotage efforts, and some of this has been reported in the press. So, well, how can can you talk about that, or to what extent can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, Poland has always insisted on on the necessity of strengthening our cyber defenses and generally acquiring some new tools in order to counter uh, the Russian active measures. It's a very specific terminology, of course, uh, or hybrid measures, if you will. That you know, this is one of the very few things Russia excels at, actually. Instilling fear in Western societies, and this is one of, of, of those uh, elements, one of those links in this, in this long chain of Russia's malign activities in uh, Europe, not only in Poland, but especially in some countries which have been infiltrated profoundly over the last decades, even under communist rule in the Soviet Union, by Russian uh, agents and the so-called useful idiots many Western intellectuals who are following you know, the party line, so to speak, in relations with uh, the Soviet Union and then with Russia. I don't know whether we have sufficient tools to counter, for example, the Russian uh, propaganda and uh, disinformation uh, campaigns. There is another, if I may, another aspect to, to this debate about Russia's uh, hybrid measures. Namely, we have somehow neglected our relationship with countries in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa, in which Russia has enormous clout in terms of peddling their own lies and their own narrative about the origins of the war in Ukraine and the encirclement of Russia and NATO being the, you know, a potential th existential threat to the Russian Federation. We have heard so many times all those manipulations and distortions and and outright lies about the, this rivalry between Russia and the West. And all those lies fall on a very fertile ground in Brazil, in India, let alone North Korea or uh, Iran. We have neglected our own narrative and our, our own storytelling, if you will, in those countries. I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is that in the in the 70s and in the 80s, approximately 100,000 young people from the so-called third world countries received scholarships in universities in the Soviet Union, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in other Soviet cities. Now they are in their 60s and in their 70s. They are presidents, heads of state, prime ministers, foreign ministers, celebrities, lawmakers, journalists, speaking Russian, constantly exposed to Russian narratives and to Russian rhetoric. And they rule those countries, or many of them, former students at Soviet universities. So I think we have, we have a, a very important task to reverse this trend in those countries, because we are very at least here in, um, in, in Poland, in, in Germany, in France, very Eurocentric in terms of our attitude towards Russia. Uh, we have to think more globally. And we have to, well, NATO is one of the most successful coalitions and alliances in, in, wor in the world's history, but we have to broaden this coalition. We have to try to convince our partners in the so-called global south, it's no longer the, the third world, it's the global south, to, to, to join default, and to, to explain to them why Russia is still an immense threat to the free world. Poland has given so much to Ukraine, Polish society, the Polish state, but there's also been some tensions over uh, transshipment of agricultural goods and things like that, and President Zelensky got very heated about this. This caused a dispute with the last government. Where do things stand now on these issues? Are we on firmer ground? Again, being a member of the European Union, Poland doesn't have total liberty deciding its own trade policy, for example. So we have to follow the, uh, the European Union's guidelines and directives. In this respect, I think and I'm, opt I'm optimistic about that because it's in our mutual interest to sort it out and to find common ground in our negotiations with the Ukrainian government with regard to, to all those protests that have been making headlines recently of Polish farmers, but also more generally of European farmers. Ukraine is, you know, and has always been the breadbasket 
of Europe. It's a, a, you know, an um, inherently European country. And I do believe, and I keep my fingers crossed for Ukraine to join the European Union one day, not only NATO. But still, it, it will be a very arduous and a very long process because you know, the agricultural policy has always been a very thorny issue you know, in the framework of the European Union's policy in this respect. I do believe that the Polish government has a, a very important role to play. Poland is, a, is also an agricultural country, a, a major exporter of, uh, of foodstuffs. So there is some you know, rivalry or competition built in our relationship with Ukraine, which is natural, understandable, but also, I think, not insurmountable. Again, the, this will be, the, the, I, I do believe that the negotiations with, the, with Ukraine, or in terms of Ukraine's accession to the European Union, will begin shortly, but they won't be easy. Also, because there are some other countries which uh, also export a lot of food uh, and uh, the, which will compete with uh, Ukraine in this area. I don't know if you can answer this or if you're willing to answer this, but you know, ambassadors are famously targets uh, for espionage. How much did your own security situation change in terms of being a target for Russian espionage when the war in Ukraine started? Ask the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, we, we have uh, somehow boosted our security measures, if you will. But generally, the, the, the protocol hasn't changed much. I mean, uh, it's, it's quite obvious for us that uh, Russia has always been our uh, potential threat, also in terms of, of diplomatic breaches, cyber warfare, and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, in, in the diplomatic world, it's something natural that you have to be very, very careful using, for example, all electronic devices. Your president and prime minister are in town the week that this will air. As far as defense military issues, what are the big items on the agenda for their meeting with President Biden and uh, meetings with Congress? Yes, as I said, we are buying a lot of, of military equipment from American defense companies. We have bought, my memory doesn't fail me, about 350 Abrams uh, main battle tanks, Apaches. Uh, we are going to have the, uh, the largest fleet of Apaches outside of the United States. But one of my priorities and, and, and the Polish government's is to try to persuade American companies to, uh, to relocate or locate part of their production also in Poland and in other Central European countries. Poland has become you know, a hub for regional military production. We want to increase our own uh, industrial capabilities in, in a significant way, but we also expect American companies to understand how profitable and how cost-efficient it would be to, for example, build new manufacturing facilities in Poland, to invest in infrastructure. It's important to have more American troops on Polish soil. It's important to buy more American aircraft and helicopters and uh, howitzers. But it's also important to attract more American companies to Poland because, uh, you know, not only politically and militarily, but also logistically, it is absolutely reasonable for American companies to, to you know, place part of, of their activities in Poland. I also suspect, and this is a good thing, that doing that would make the political coalition in Poland that backs high defense spending much more durable. There is a widespread consensus, in, in, you know, in spite of political differences we might have in, in, in the politi Polish, on, the politi on the Polish political stage. There is, I think, a, a very wi a widespread and profound consensus about the necessity of strengthening our military capabilities. The, the, the new ruling coalition understands that. The current opposition understands that, and, and uh, the Polish ambassador to the US, to the US also understands that. <laughs> and this is, you know, I think eighty or ninety percent of my time and energy and efforts are devoted to to talks about um, American military, political, and military engagement in our part of the world. Sometimes I also speak on behalf of, of our other partners in Central Europe, the Czechs, the Romanians, the Lithuanians, the Bulgarians, as they do on behalf of the Polish government. Because we, 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 we've had the same experience, as I said, with Russian occupation, with Russian recurrent aggressions against uh, Central European countries and nations. And we know Russia much better than many other European countries. Among your fellow ambassadors here in Washington, who are some of the ones you enjoy spending the most time with as friends? Hard to say. Uh, Stavros Lambrinidis has been a very good friend of mine since the beginning of my mission. The, uh, now the former EU ambassador to Washington DC. He's now in New York at the UN headquarters. I used to be a Polish ambassador to Israel. 
And also, I'm a, a Spanish philologist by training. And he, he is Greek. So, you know, the Mediterranean culture and the Mediterranean cuisine and football and so many other things that we shared that it was, you know, fun and pleasure always to talk with him and, and to, to meet him. But of course, you know, also, I do believe that the European Union as such is, again, despite all misgivings we might have about the, the, the functioning of this particular political entity, it is so important in, in terms of uh, our transatlantic relationship. And that's why, for example, I always I keep saying that, you know, it's, it's not only Poland, it's not only Bulgaria, it's not only Lithuania. We are Europeans. And that's why, on the final note, whenever I speak with my American interlocutors, be it Republicans, be it Democrats, liberals or conservatives, I, I rarely hear, and when we talk about the transatlantic relations, I rarely hear the term allies, friends or partners. And this is something that concerns me because I wouldn't like Americans to consider the European Union or Europe to be a rival. Of course, in, you know, in terms of trade, we do compete on the global stage. But generally, we are partners. And that's why it's, it's another of my priorities also to strengthen the image of Europe or of the European Union as an entity which is friendly to the United States and which is indispensable with regard to our real rivalry and a real political and economic confrontation with, uh, with countries like Russia or China. What are some books that have meant a lot to you throughout your life? I could uh, mention uh, hundreds of books written by Spanish and Latin American authors, as you probably imagine. I, I, I read voraciously about the Cold War, books written by both Anglo-Saxon historians and Polish experts. I've read a book uh, about the Cold War written by a Norwegian historian, uh, a, a very interesting overview of, of the global rivalry between the United States and, and Russia. And this is something I, I, I've already mentioned, to what extent we have neglected our relations also during the Cold War and, and subsequently with those countries in, in, in Latin America and Asia in Africa, there are some, you know, uh, you have just browsed one of the books which is under my desk here about the, the secret state in Poland during World War II, an underground state which ac actually allowed us to survive the German and the Soviet invasion and uh, occupation. A story, a uh, uh, bravery, immense courage and resilience. And I think that this is something we have learned Throughout, his, throughout our history, a country uh, which is geographically located in a very risky place, actually, has to learn how to survive in any circumstances. Yes, and I, I saw it under your, before we started recording, I saw it uh, under your coffee table, Story of a Secret State by Karski, and coincidentally just got a copy that I ordered this morning, so I'm looking forward to digging into this. Great. And I really appreciate your time, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the War on the Rocks podcast. Please don't forget to check out our membership program at warontherocks.com slash membership. 